O oh Lord, we stand before you today, Father, under the authority of the risen Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your name. We thank you, Lord, that in your name we can find healing. We thank you, Lord, that in your name we can find restoration. And so, Lord God, this morning we stand here by the grace of God. And we thank you so much for bringing us all together. And Lord, I pray that as we learn from your word this morning, may you open our hearts, help us to understand truth this morning from scripture. Reveal to us, Lord, what it is that you want to say to us. And may we take it, Lord, with open hands, open heart, open spirits, ready to respond to you for whatever it is that you would call us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you here this morning, and uh, welcome, of course, to our uh, online brothers and sisters who are joining us this morning. Now, how amazing is that eight baptisms last Sunday afternoon are by the river? Amazing. Um, too bad, though, there was no hot water on that one. And uh, I hope that it's not, it wasn't too cold for some people. And I also hope and pray that you were encouraged by the report of our Indonesia team that, that went to Indonesia recently in September. And, uh, and thank you so much for your prayers for us, your support and your encouragement. And uh, it was such a great opportunity for us to be partnering with what God is doing in that part of the world. Now last Sunday, uh, Nick launched into our new series and he was talking about being totally available as we seek to serve the Lord and follow His purpose in our lives. And so today, I will be continuing on uh, in our series, and I'll be speaking on the topic of ever hopeful. And let me start with you by sharing this story about a Holocaust survivor named Il Ili Wiesel, a Romanian-born Jew. He said that, do we have a photo of that one, Ross? Yes, thank you. Uh, Eli Wiesel is a Romanian Jew. He said that just as man cannot live without dreams, he cannot live without hope. And, and he spoke at the, the opening of the Holocaust Museum uh, in the United States in New York. Hope is what sustained the Jewish people through their long and bitter exile during the Holocaust. And hope really leaves room for God and His providence. Hope uh, basically lets us believe that no matter how dark the world seems to be, no matter how difficult the situation is, there can be a better tomorrow if we have hope. Over the years, there has been plenty of research that's being done about hope and how it impacts the human spirit. Dr. Adam Stern from Harvard Health said this, hope is beginning to reveal its value in scientific studies. Among young adults with chronic illnesses, for example, greater degrees of hope are associated with improved coping, well-being, and engagement in healthy behaviors. He also said it also protects against depression and suicide. Among teens, hope is linked with health, quality of life, self-esteem, and a sense of purpose. It is an essential factor for developing maturity and resilience. And I think the Indonesia report uh, this morning really speaks so highly of that, that in the most desperate, miserable living conditions of people, children, Parents, even the teachers, young adults who are so passionate about bringing the light of Jesus into that community. See, this great sense of hope breaks out the darkness. This, this hope brings light into the most difficult situation anywhere else in the world. The wise King Solomon said in Proverbs 13, verse 12, he said, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And King David reaffirmed this in Psalm 25, verse 3. He said, no one who hopes in you, Lord, will be ever put to shame. Amen. So as we consider our theme this morning, let's read our passage. And my hope and prayer is that as we look at the life, the conversion, the transformation of Paul, that we will develop this sense of being hopeful. Acts chapter 9 is our text this morning. And I'll be reading from verse 1 
to verse 19. It said, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the Christians, the followers of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Soul, soul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, lest, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. This street actually still exists to this day. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias said, Look at how Ananias argued with God. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell off from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he, could, he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Amen. What a beautiful, incredible, dramatic experience in Paul's journey and Paul's life. You see, let me share with you just a few brief contextual uh, facts and background about the book of Acts. The first few chapters preceding chapter 9 really starts off with Jesus ascending into heaven, leaving his disciples behind with a promise that the Holy Spirit will come. The disciples then began to regroup. They decided to replace Judas with another disciple called Matthias. And the Holy Spirit came and empowered the disciples. And Peter in particular began to preach with boldness. And many people believe in the first century church was birth. The book of Acts was also written by Luke, and he was a doctor, a physician, and possibly a Gentile. He was not one of the 12 that Jesus chose. He was not, he made the possibility of it that he was probably one of the 70 disciples that Jesus had appointed to go, and scholars have also argued that he may also have accompanied Paul in Paul's missionary journeys. And if we read the previous chapters of Acts from 1 to 8, the emphasis really begin to shift as we read chapter 9. Let me highlight with you these three shifts. The first shift is this, that a focus from Apostle Peter and the other apostles to the Apostle Paul. The focus from the Palestine region, Jerusalem, Israel region, into the Mediterranean world and going out from the Jewish people into the Gentile world. There is a shift. The move of the Holy Spirit is shifting and moving forward. Why? In order to fulfill Acts 1.8. When Jesus said, but you will, re you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth in order to fulfill that. And so the focus is beginning to shift into the rest of the world outside of the region of Palestine. 
Now this morning, I would like to highlight with you three timeless truths that we can learn from the conversion of Paul. And hopefully, it will give us a sense of being hopeful in whatever situation we may find ourselves. The first timeless truth is that persecution is inevitable. Since the birth of the first century church, there were many exciting things that took place. Peter had the boldness and the courage to stand up in big crowds and preach about the risen Savior. He preached with boldness through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he stood there, and people believed. In the book of Acts, 3,000 believed and was baptized that day, and it said that the Lord added to their number daily. And all of a sudden, the church was birthed, and it wasn't a small church at all. It was a mega church. To our standards today, anything above 500 in population is considered big. Imagine 3,000. That was the birth of the early church. And yet verses 1 and 2 of our text says that Saul was still breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And as he went to the high priest to ask for a letter, basically equivalent to like a warrant of arrest for the believers in the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he finds anyone who belonged to the way, who were following Jesus, who belonged to this group of Christians and believers, men or women, that he might take them as prisoners and captives and bring them back to Jerusalem. And when they are found to be guilty, that was considered blasphemy, Paul would stone them to death. His persecution campaign was so intense and covered huge area. Yet one of the great things that came out of persecution was the expansion of Christianity beyond the regions of Jerusalem, beyond the regions of Israel. That was, was something amazing that came out of the persecution, something good. When believers were scattered, they persevered in the power of the Holy Spirit. They continued to bear witness of the resurrected Jesus, and they were able to persevere only because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And you see, you and I can only do that. We can only persevere hardship and persecution and difficulties in life through the power of the Holy Spirit. We might think and say to ourselves, I actually don't know if I will be able to survive persecution. You see, in our own strength, we will never be able to. But the Lord has promised that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Amen. Amen. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. The joy of the Lord will give us the strength so that we can persevere hardship. We will be able to persevere in the power of the Holy Spirit. One beautiful demonstration of God's providence is what we can read in Acts chapter 7 about the stoning of Stephen. It said here in verse 55 to 56, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. It was God's providential grace for Stephen so that he can actually endure being stoned to death. That was God's providence of grace to him. That same providential grace is available for us today. So we need not fear about persecution. As we sit here today, thousands in different parts of the world who are going through severe persecution because of their faith. According to Open Doors World Watch List, There are more than 365 million Christians who are going through persecution as we sit here today. Another report is that in 2023 alone, there's about 5,000 Christians that were being killed and only those that are being reported. The number is actually much higher than that, just in that one year alone, last year. The first century church experienced severe persecution And over thousands of years after the first century church, we are still being persecuted. And it will continue this way. In fact, the Bible says that in the last days, it is just going to get harder. Amen? Amen. You see, in the West, we have to be very careful about our own attitudes towards persecution. 
Yes, it is becoming obvious that Christianity is being pushed sometimes into the margins of our society, but let us be careful not to equate that as our own Western version of persecution. This is not only wrong, but also an insult to thousands and thousands of Christians around the world who are at risk and sometimes being disowned by their families, thrown into prison, killed because of their faith in Jesus or when they change religion. I was talking to one of our Iranian brothers on Friday as we were walking and praying. And I said, Jonathan, in Iran, it's very common that once a Muslim changed religion, especially Christianity, this is what's going to happen to them. It's not like if this will happen to them, their family will disown them and to the point of they will be killed because of their decision to follow Jesus. You see, persecution is inevitable. But let us hold on to the promise of Jesus in John 16, He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, in this world you may have trouble. He didn't say, in this world you might have trouble. It's a possibility. No, he said, in this world you will have trouble. There is a guarantee that you will have trouble. But then the flip side of the grace of God, he said, but take heart. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Fear not. I have overcome the world. The second timeless truth we can learn from Paul's conversion is that no person is beyond the reach of God. Amen? No person is beyond the reach of God. Verses 3 to 9 of our text tells us about what happened to Paul in this particular journey to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Damascus in Syria. Paul alludes to this experience as the beginning the catalyst of his new life in Christ, that as he was approaching the city of Damascus, the Lord stopped him in his tracks. He saw a bright light, he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice from heaven. Notice the different verbs, uh, that is a progression in this action here. It's described as he saw the light, he fell to the ground, and he heard. He saw, he fell, he heard. He saw, he fell, he heard. Why? Because of the power of the Spirit of God. That was the beginning of his transformation. Paul's experience can be described as a sprint. A very sudden turnaround. At any normal given circumstances for some people, change and transformation can actually take time. Days, months, years. But for Paul, it only took three days. And he had this beautiful interaction and conversation with God. Now let me just interject this. When something is repeated in the Bible, it is important. Now if you notice in our passage here, God called out to Paul twice. So, so, why? And I have a feeling that in this there is an interaction and a dialogue and it could look like this. Jesus said, Saul. He suddenly responded, who is it? And Jesus said again, Saul, who are you? Isn't that the natu natural response for people? If you hear, hear your name being called out, you go, who is it? Who's calling? Jesus said, why do you persecute me? Then Saul began to realize that it's something different. And he said, who are you, Lord? And then Jesus said, I am Jesus. What are you saying? Whom you are persecuting. What do you want from me? And he said, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. It's so easy to brush off, soul, soul, Jesus said this. But if you actually take the time to pause. And I was taking the time to pause in this interaction. This is what the Lord revealed to me, that Paul really did have a genuine conversation with Jesus. He wasn't hallucinating. He wasn't high on something. He didn't take anything as far as I know, or as far as the Bible says. He did not see kind of fuzzy visions. He saw. He fell to the ground because of the glory of God. 
And he heard Jesus spoke to him very clearly. For Paul, the three days transformation was really can be described as a sprint because he spent time praying and fasting and he came out the other end completely different person. The difference was so stark that people who knew him before could not believe it is the same person. They could not believe the change and the transformation in his life. In fact, they were talking about, isn't he the one that used to kill Christians? Isn't he the one that used to chase and persecute and murder and put Christians to jail? Isn't he the one that used to? They just could not believe the 180 degrees turn and shift of Paul's transformation. But one interesting thing that I have observed in this is that he saw, he heard, he fell, and uh, sorry, he fell and he heard. The men traveling with him also heard the sound, and then they were speechless of the sound, but they did not hear anything. They did not hear the voice. That is interesting, isn't it? At this specific point, God only wants to reveal himself to Paul and not to the other men. He could have done it. He could have done it and many will believe. No, he could have done it, but he didn't. That's going to be one question I'm going to ask Jesus. Like, Why didn't you save the other men too? So that it's not just Paul going. That you actually have a band of army like preaching and proclaiming. Like why? You see, it's God's prerogative really who to reveal himself to or not. Amen? Amen. That is amazing. We also see here how God uses other people as part of Paul's journey of transformation. An ordinary man, a disciple, a follower of Jesus named Ananias entered into this story unexpectedly. And God told him in a vision what to do. You see, God had a much bigger plan for Saul. And in spite of his track record, the evil things that he had done, the hatred that he had against Christians, Saul was not beyond the reach of God. Let me tell you this this morning, tell, let me tell you this, that not one person on this earth is beyond the reach of God's hand. And just like Ananias, God can use you and I to bring others to himself. And God's Holy Spirit still continues to touch and transform lives today, and he will continue to do so until he comes no one is beyond the reach of God. The third truth I'd like to share with you today is that Paul was called to proclaim his name. In verses 15 to 19 of our text is a really interesting story because uh, God called Ananias as he entered into this story. And God gave him very clear instruction. He said, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentile world and their kings and to the people of Israel. You see, what took place in verses 17 to 19 is such a tangible picture of the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, Ananias placed his hand on Paul. And, and he said, Brother Paul, can you imagine the language there? Can you imagine? Can you picture? He did not label him of his identity before. Murderous Paul, persecutor Paul. No, he didn't say that. He said, Brother Paul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and he got baptized. He was God's chosen instrument to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. You see, Luke, the writer of Acts, described this beautiful metaphor of scales, like scales of a fish that is like this thin membrane of film. And this symbolizes that when the blinding film was gone, light broke into Paul's darkness and he understood truth. Amen. That is the significance of it. We owe to him the New Testament, half of the New Testament we owe to Paul. Paul embarked on four missionary journeys, traveling about 15,000 kilometers. 
his willingness to travel great distances to preach the risen Christ and help establish Christianity, not just in the Palestine world, not just in the Mediterranean world, but even right up to Asia and Asia Minor. And the scholars have agreed that all in all, Paul have roughly planted between 14 to 20 churches. What we know now as the gospel of grace, we owe to the preaching of Paul. Amen? Because he was the one that was sent to the Gentiles. But you see, you and I have the same mandate. We are called to proclaim his name. Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace and who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. God called Paul to proclaim the good news. God is also calling you and I to proclaim the good news, to bring the light of Jesus into the darkest parts of the earth. No matter what the circumstances, whether facing persecution or hardship or suffering, we need to be ever hopeful because our hope is in Jesus and not in our circumstances. Amen? We need to be ever hopeful that for the salvation of people in our lives who do not know Jesus yet. And we need to be ever hopeful for the glory that will be revealed to us. And so let us be committed to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let's bow our heads together. In the quietness and in the silence, I'd like to encourage you to reflect on these two things. Are there people in your life that you want to see come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? The second thing I'd like you to reflect is this. Are there people in your family, in your community, in your friendship circle that you have given up praying? Father, in the quietness of this room, we want to bring you these thoughts. We want to bring before you these names of people that we so desperately want to see come to know you, Jesus. And Lord, we also want to bring before you some of these people and some of these names that we have given up praying for their salvation. Maybe our circumstance changed, we moved location, we got cut off, we're no longer in touch. And yet the beauty of it, Lord, is that you continue to bring others and new people in our path that we can be proactively praying. And so this morning, Father, I pray that you will bring afresh people in our families, people in our community, in our friendship circle, that we can proactively pray, that we can intentionally pray so that they may come to know you. And this morning, Lord, as a follow-up response to Nick's message last week, may we be totally available to you because we have this hope in Jesus Christ that we want to share to the world. Amen.